Well, again, good morning and welcome to Freedom. So glad to see you here. Uh, to those of you who are joining us online, uh, welcome to you. Uh, we're glad to have you be a part of worship in that way. Uh, as Tony said, uh, it is an interesting season, isn't it? As if a, a global pandemic and uh, nationwide marches and protests were not enough, we decided to throw in a tropical storm to keep it really fun and interesting today. Uh, thank you for weathering that. Uh, I told Tony maybe next week we could, we could work in like an earthquake or a zombie apocalypse or something just so we don't get bored. Somebody said uh, if the year 2020 were a drink, it would probably have to be the colonoscopy prep stuff that everybody wants to gag on. It's, uh, it has been a difficult year so far, it is, uh, but it is comforting to know that God is in control and that uh, we can trust Him through this season. I thought maybe it would be good for us to start this morning with some good news. Could you use some good news in the midst of all that's been going on? Well, I am thrilled to report to you that six hours ago, Freedom Church Nigeria met and worshiped together for the very first time. That is awesome. Uh, I got just a real short uh, video piece from Isaiah yesterday. And we spoke briefly two or three times. The connections were just so bad we could never make it through more than a minute or two before we'd get cut off. But uh, they are so excited. The team has been out going door-to-door, -door, inviting people to the new church and doing door-to-door -door evangelism. And they are just so thrilled about what God is doing there. We are too. Thank you for what you've invested there. They're meeting in a little rented facility for now. And as soon as the situation allows for it, we will begin construction on a new church building for them over there. And uh, as uh, we were talking in huddle this morning, somebody pointed out, with all that's happening right now, how beautiful and perfect is it that right now is the time that Freedom Church is able to create its second campus in Nigeria to, to reach Africans in their homeland. There's just something really perfect about that. So we celebrate what God is doing there. Uh, I'll keep you updated. Uh, I was hoping to hear from Isaiah maybe before, before we got started, but I know he's very busy today. He preached the inaugural service for the church over there. Our, our good friend, Pastor Isaiah, did. So we celebrate all of that. Well, today we're going to be in Joshua chapter 5. If you've got your Bibles, uh, feel free to turn there, or you can just pull out your outline and, and work from there. I want to just go ahead and say a couple of things on the front end today. Um, first of all, I want to be clear that what I'm going to talk about today is not intended in any way to be political. I don't have any interest in influencing how you vote. I really do not. So please don't misconstrue anything that you're going to hear today as an attempt to point you in one direction or the other because I'm not interested in doing that. The other thing that I would say is that with what's being tackled today in light of all that's going on in the country right now and now spreading to other countries, I think there's a timeliness that makes what we're addressing today significant. But I just want to say this on the front end. I'm going to say some things today that different people are not going to like. And it's not because I'm trying to be controversial. I don't have any desire to, to be controversial, but I, I get it. I will say some things today that some white folks are not going to like. And I'm going to say some other things today that some black people are not going to like. And what I'm asking all of us to do, whether you're here in the room or watching or listening online, is to trust each other enough and to love each other enough that we can talk about difficult things and know that no one is being attacked in the process. But there's just there are times in life when within a family and within a, a group of close friends that we've got to be willing to tackle the tough stuff and to talk candidly about it, not for the purpose of putting any down, anybody down or beating them up, but to say some things out loud to try and better understand what's really going on and what we need to do as we move forward. So I, I will just go ahead and say the latter third of the message is going to have some, some candor to it. So please still love me when we're done. Everything I'm going to say today is, is spoken out of a heart of love, not out of condemnation. I'm going to first tackle the biblical text, and then in the latter third of the message, I'm just going to share more specifically about the things that are going on in the country right now. But the, the message today in this series that's entitled Courage to Overcome, the message today is about overcoming personal bias. Where we pick up today is pretty much where we left off last week. The people of God, after 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, 
trying to move toward the land that God had promised for his people. They finally get to the edge of the promised land, and under Joshua's leadership, we saw last week, they miraculously get to cross over the Jordan River, and now they're about to take possession of this land that they have waited for generations to go and possess. But before they do that, the, you know, the very beginning of Joshua 6 is going to be them having to tackle the first gigantic obstacle, and that is this huge walled city of Jericho, and it's such a challenge to think how they're going to take this city. But before they can do that, there is a profound set of truths that, that Joshua and the people must hear and understand. And so we have this very unique little section that's just three verses that we're going to focus on today. And I just think it speaks so clearly to a lot of what's happening in our country right now. We read in Joshua 15, 13. Now when Joshua was near Jericho, he looked up and he saw a man standing in front of him with a drawn sword in his hand. Joshua went up to him and asked, Are you for us or for our enemies? Neither, he replied, but as the commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. Then Joshua fell face down to the ground in reverence and asked him, What message does my Lord have for his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army replied, Take off your sandals, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. I can only imagine that at this point in time, Joshua's thinking is all wrapped around one thing, and that is the next challenge. He's leading this ragtag bunch of essentially two million Jewish people who aren't really an organized nation, and they don't really have an organized army, and he is now leading them in what is going to be one battle after another as they face the cities in the promised land, and, and the first one is going to be a really challenging battle because Jericho is such an imposing place. And so you can only imagine how much his thinking is just totally dialed into how are we going to conquer these Canaanites? How are we going to bring down the city of Jericho? And as he's thinking about this, he sort of stumbles upon this figure. Now, we're not completely sure who it is. It's one of two people. It is either Jesus himself in the flesh or it is the archangel over the armies of God who is directly under Jesus. It doesn't matter. It obviously doesn't matter which one it is because they both represent God's power and God's presence in the equation. But the thing that's almost humorous about it is when Joshua sees this figure, whether it's Jesus or the archangel, we'll, we'll just refer to him as the angel of the Lord. It's what the Old Testament does a lot of times when it's not really clear if it's Jesus or Jesus' representative in, a, in the form of an angel. But Joshua recognizes that this figure, this person, is mightier than anyone in his army. And it, it occurs to him that this is a warrior because he's standing there with drawn sword. And I can only imagine that Joshua is thinking as he's looking at him, I don't know whose side he is on, but I've got a feeling whatever side he takes, that's who's going to win the battle. This guy's more imposing than anybody in my camp. I hope he's for us and not against us is what he's thinking. And so he walks up, and he does a pretty sensible, bold thing. He just asks him directly, are you for us or are you for our enemies over there? Because it really matters. Which one are you? And the response is classic and timeless. The angel of the Lord replies, neither. I am the commander of God's army, and I have come. The message is this. I didn't come to take sides. I came to take over. I didn't come to side with the Jewish people or to side with the Canaanite people. I came declaring I've already chosen a side, and it is God's side, and I didn't come to pick sides. I came to take control. It's a really timely word for us today. I picture Joshua at this point thinking, okay, I don't really know what that means is there anything else that you have for me? He says, do you have a message for me? And then he delivers such a simple message. Take off your shoes. Because the ground that you're standing on is holy ground. Now, I don't know about you, but when, when I read that on a first pass, it's like, well, that sounds like a good intro now to, all right, we're going to be reverent in how we approach the Lord, and then he's going to give us a message. No, that is the message. Take off your shoes because where you're standing is holy ground. What's the point of that message? Well, it's actually pretty simple and straightforward. Right now, 
Your focus is on who controls this land. Who's going to get to take this ground? This is our land. This is going to be our territory. God gave it to us. We're going to claim this land, and we're going to control what happens on this land. And the Lord, through his representative, says this. Don't misunderstand what's happening here. This isn't Canaanite ground, and this isn't Israelite ground. This is holy ground. And holy ground is ground that belongs to God and is going to be set apart for what God wants to do here. And you'd better make sure that, that your focus is singularly on that. That what happens here is going to have to be about God and his agenda and his priorities. It's not about who owns the land, who controls the land, who's in charge among our people. God is planning to do something holy in this land. And what you'd better do is get your thinking and your lives wrapped around that. What is God wanting to do in this land? Now the reason I said I think this passage is so appropriate for where we are today is because of Joshua's initial response and mindset and how it so well represents not only how we tend to think, but how human beings always in history tend to think, and that is in binary terms. We love binary situations, don't we? In fact, we would love to reduce everything down to sort of a, a binary understanding, a binary decision. And you know what I mean when I say that? It's an either or. It's, it's me versus you. It's us versus them. You choose. Which one are you for? If you're with me, you're my friend and my ally. If you're not with me, then you have to be on the other side. You have to be my enemy. And we love those kinds of terms in all kinds of scenarios. Throughout history, this is just the way people tend to think. For thousands of years, people have been in an us and them mindset where we're, we're biased toward everybody that's not us. Thousands of years, the Arabs have despised the Jewish people. The Jewish people have despised Arabic people. And, and we, could just, we could flesh that out all over the globe. In the Far East, different Asian groups despise one another. In Southern Asia, the Pakistanis can't stand the Indians. The Indians can't stand the Pakistanis. We could just go around the globe. And right here in the U.S., whites struggle to love blacks. Blacks struggle to love whites. And both struggle to love Hispanics and Latinos and Asians and Middle Easterners. We just we put ourselves in this box of a mindset that's us and then all of them. And the angel of the Lord shows up to say, God blows up that paradigm. God doesn't look at any of this as a binary situation. He says, I, I don't even buy into that. I, I, I don't subscribe to that way of thinking that it's us and them. I am neither. I'm not us and I'm not them. I am the Lord of all. There are two things that I want to share from this passage, and I'm going to try and move through these pretty quickly, and then when we're done with the outline... We're going to dive into some stuff that's, that's particularly relevant to what we're watching today. The first thing that I want us to consider is the biases that we tend to struggle with that we're going to have to overcome if we're going to see God's kingdom ushered in here in our lifetimes and if we're going to see God do what he wants to in and through us. So first of all, I want us to just recognize the biases that they had then and that we tend to struggle with now. Three that I'll point out to you. First of all, there is the bias that says, this is our land and you don't belong here. The Canaanites certainly were guilty of that thinking. They did not want all these Jews invading their land. In fact, kind of everywhere they went, they ran into that mindset. This is our land, you don't get to come here. Uh, Numbers chapter 21 is a great example of that. When Moses is leading the people through the wilderness and he has to pass through Amorite territory and he knows they're a powerful people. They've got a vast army, and so they better be very careful. So he sends word to Sihon, the king of the Amorites, and says, May we please just pass through. We'll stay on the king's highway. We won't eat any of your food. We won't go into your vineyards. We won't consume anything. We won't harm anything. We'll just stay on the road. We just want to get through to the other side. And Sihon, Sihon sends out a, a message and says, No, you can't pass through our territory. It's our land, and you don't belong here. You don't even get to walk through here. Well, it's a terrible mistake. He marches out with his army to, to attack the Israelites because they're not allowed in his land. 
And the scripture says, after he mustered his entire army and marched out in the wilderness against Israel, when he reached Jahaz, he fought with Israel. But Israel, however, put him to the sword and took over his land. People would talk about this for many generations to come because it was such an unlikely outcome. The same thing happened with the next king that they encountered, Og, king of Bashan. And the very same thing unfolded time and again. People saying, you stinking Jews can't come here. This is our land, and you don't belong here in the land. And they would try and, and send them packing, and they always ended up losing their land as a result of that. The great irony is that the Jewish people, once they had come in and conquered and had taken the Holy Land, they began to be guilty of the very same thing that the possessors of that land before them had done. They started thinking the same way. This is our land, and we don't like anybody else on our land. And they began to look down on every other group as being just almost subhuman, all of those, those pagan Gentiles. We don't want them among us. And it became such a pervasive bias and bad attitude that the Lord confronted it time and again through the prophets. A good example is Jeremiah. He did so repeatedly through Jeremiah, such as in Jeremiah 7, 5 and following, where the Lord says to his people through Jeremiah, I will keep you safe only if. Everybody say only if. That's the condition. I'll keep you safe only if you change your ways and are fair and honest with each other. Stop taking advantage of foreigners orphans and widows don't kill innocent people then i will let you enjoy a long life in the land that i gave your ancestors this is a recurring theme in jeremiah if you want to enjoy the blessing and favor and the protection of god you're going to have to start behaving differently toward the weakest and most vulnerable among you and he says children the orphans the widows and the immigrants the foreigners who live among you that you are so biased against You've got to treat them with respect, honesty, and compassion. Friends, we struggle immensely in America with this. We're, we're listening constantly right now to all of the black versus white stuff, and yet both groups, black and white, need to recognize we collectively struggle horribly with how we respond to immigrants in our country. <clears throat> now, the last time I referenced this, a number of people took offense, no big shock, but they have misunderstood and misrepeated what I said and what I'll say again today. I don't know what our immigration policy needs to be in America, and I'm certainly not lobbying for any position. It's complex. I don't have the answers. I don't know if we need a wall or if we should avoid building a wall. I don't know. So I have no interest in lobbying anybody in a particular direction. I know that the answer is not that all countries should just open their gates and everybody go wherever they want to. I've never suggested that, that. The good news is we don't have to figure that out. That's not our job. Our job in that regard is to pray for and to elect godly men and women who will wrestle with these things and make the decisions. Our responsibility is to show God's kindness and compassion toward the people who are here. Because the simple fact of the matter is there are millions and millions of immigrants who are already here and long lines more who are trying to get here. And rather than us getting tied up in, in knots over what we're going to do about the people who are here, we better just listen to what the scriptures say and show compassion and concern for the people who are here around us. We need to be honest in confronting our own personal bias toward people that we want to say, you don't belong here, this is our land. We need to hear the voice of the Lord saying, it isn't their land and it isn't your land. It's holy land. It is God's land. The scripture says the earth is the Lord's and everything in it. We are just tenants on his land. So we'd better be careful how heavy-handed we are in defending who gets to come on what we think is our land. It's his. There's a second bias. It is the bias of thinking power and might make us right. The people in Jericho and other people groups in the Holy Land certainly were guilty of that thinking. 
The very next verse, if we continued reading, is Joshua 6, 1, where it says, Now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went in and no one came out. The, the Canaanites thought, we are the people of, of Jericho. We are secure. We've got the army. We've got the chariots. We've got the, the huge wall to this city. And we're going to control the day. We've got the power. I don't have time to unpack this today, so I'm just going to say this very succinctly. Any of us who find ourselves in positions of power, and I'm just going to be real honest about things today, that would include everybody that's seated in this room today. In American culture, we represent those who come from backgrounds that are privileged and empowered. It is just a fact. We don't recognize many times just how much that is the case. And it is, it is natural and tempting because we, we are in positions of power and influence to think, well, God made it this way. And the direction that we go must be okay. And that we'll be guilty of not taking the extra effort to consider what life is like for those who are not in power. For those who are disadvantaged. And I'll say this and just and move on. There is one people group more than any other in all of history, and it's still true today, who have not operated from a position of power. They have been the most vulnerable, and they have been the most taken advantage of of anyone in history, and that is women collectively. Due to sheer physical strength and might, men have dominated women for all of history. There is no group that has suffered at the hands of others more than women, and it has not evaporated or gone away in the 21st century. And We don't have time today to unpack that issue, but, but it is a very real issue that we live in a world that still very much favors and caters to men and places women at a disadvantage. It is a bias. And then there's a third one I want to point out, and it is the bias that says you are different from me, so you must be my enemy. It goes back to to Joshua's question, that, that binary kind of thinking. Whose side are you on? Ours or our enemy? Now, I think there are three primary ways that we express or, or think of this bias today more than any other. There is the obvious one, and that is race. We think that that, that naturally divides us into black and white or Hispanic or whatever, you know. We, we just quickly identify with people who look like us in terms of race. Religion becomes a real natural, and it's, it's crazy to consider within the Christian faith how many times we'll look at people who are a different denomination, a different flavor of Christianity, and we'll look at them as if they are the enemy or the competition. But far worse within the, the realm of religion that we tend to look at people of other faiths as if they are the enemy. If you're Buddhist, if you're Hindu, and God forbid if you're Muslim, Ooh, the dreaded enemy out there. I'm not suggesting for a minute that all religions have equal value. They certainly don't. Or that all religions are the same. They most certainly are not. But the point that I'm making is we can't operate with a bias that causes us to, to hate or want nothing to do with people from other faiths because if we have to wait until they become Christians for us to love them, how are we ever going to reach anyone? The message of Jesus was never love the people who already believe what you believe. So we struggle with major bias over, change, over differences in faith. And the final one is one that is so pervasive today. And that is division over politics. I don't know that there's ever been a time, at least in my lifetime, when we've been more divided in terms of our politics. Are you a conservative or are you a liberal? Because that's going to define whether or not we can really be friends and talk about things that matter. If I'm a conservative and you're a liberal, you're, you're bad. You're bad. You're, you're probably one of those baby killers. Or if I'm a, a liberal and you're a conservative, i got to think you're bad for, for different reasons. But we look at each other as if we're the enemy because we don't share the same political ideology. That's a horrible mistake to make. All of these are biases that we struggle with. So how do we begin to address that? Well, there are two messages that stand out from this encounter that we just read about that we have to hold on to, two eternal truths for us to cling to. And the first one is this. 
God loves and values every human being, and so must I. I love that the response from the Lord is that I'm not for you and your group, and I'm not for that group. I represent God and his interests, and that makes me love every group. It wasn't that he didn't love the Jews or that he didn't love the Canaanites. He loves everyone, and that's why he doesn't take sides. It's why the theme verse for the whole New Testament is essentially John 3.16, that God loved the people of this world so much that he gave his only son so that who? Everyone. Say it with me. Everyone. So that everyone who has faith in him will have eternal life and never really die. God sees what he built into every one of us, and he loves every one of us, and he doesn't stop there. He doesn't just say, I'm just like a, a grandparent and I can only see the good. He sees the reality of who we are, the good and the bad, and it never causes him to stop loving us, but he doesn't cut it off at that point. He says, if you belong to me, then you must love who I love. John makes that point powerfully in 1 John 4 when he says, If anyone boasts, I love God. Well, who in the room would boast, I love God? I would. I hope you do. He says, if you boast that you love God, you can't go right on hating your brother or sister, thinking nothing of it. If you do, you're a liar. Because if he won't love the person that he can see, how can he love the God that he can't see? The command that we have from Christ is blunt. Loving God includes loving people. You've got to love both. It's a pretty simple and profound argument, isn't it? Don't say that you love the God that you cannot see with your eyes if you do not love the people who are made in the image of God. It's easy for us to lose sight of, of how wonderful and unique all humans are above everything else in creation that we're made in the image of God. Genesis 1.26, such a, an important truth here. When God is voicing his plan in creation and when, he, when the Godhead speaking to one another, say, let us make human beings in our image, make them reflecting our nature so that they can be responsible for the fish of the sea and the birds of the air, the cattle, and yes, earth itself and every animal that moves on the face of the earth. Do you recognize what an incredible endorsement, what a huge declaration this is over all of us, that God says, I am going to make you way more than anything else in creation to bear my image. You're going to be like me so that I can give you authority over everything on the planet. Every human being of every color, every tribe, every religious group, all of us still bear the image of God. Does that mean we're perfect or that we're little gods or we're going to become gods? No, none of the above. But it means that there is something wonderful, beautiful, and very good in every one of us. And we have to stay conscious of this. The people that we are prone to look down on and despise, we have to remind ourselves again and again, this is someone that God made that God values, that God loves, and God doesn't make any mistakes. So if God loves and values them, I have to choose to do the same, even if they are very much unlike me. Remember that God loves and values every human being, and so must I. And the second truth is this, that God's kingdom agenda trumps everything else. That has to sink in for us. God's kingdom agenda has to trump every other value, every other prejudice, every other agenda that we carry. How do we get this from the story? Well, it's, it's where it lands. What message do you have for me? The commander of the Lord's army replied, take off your sandals for the place where you're standing is holy. The point of holiness, the whole concept of anything being holy is that it is totally set apart for God's purposes, for God to do exactly what he wants to through that person, that thing, or that place. And the angel of the Lord is saying, God's purposes are what matter here. Not the Jewish agenda, not the Canaanite agenda, not anything else. God has a significant plan for what's going to unfold right here. And boy, does he ever. 
I mean, you realize it is only a few miles from where Joshua is standing in that moment that God is going to do the unique work that's going to save the world. The Savior of the world is going to be born just a few miles away. Just a few miles away, the Son of God is going to be crucified, and three days later, He's going to be raised from the dead, and all of human history is going to be changed by this. This is God's agenda. But here we are 3,000 plus years ago, 3,500 years ago, and Joshua and the Jewish people are doing exactly what we do today. He is thinking only in terms of us and what we're going to do and what our agenda is to take over this land and what our lives are going to be like when we get control of this land. And God is saying in the middle of that, understand this isn't about you. Do I love you? Yes, but it's not about you. It is about God and what he is wanting to do here because God's kingdom agenda is what matters. Now, that's a real generic phrase or concept for a lot of us. What do we mean by God's kingdom agenda? It means that ushering in the kingdom of God with all of the values and good things that are a part of God's righteous rule in our lives get ushered in. That means that justice for everyone is ushered in. That means that we now are defined by compassion, grace, generosity, forgiveness. When God's kingdom agenda is the priority, understand the king himself, the scripture says, the foundations of his throne are righteousness and justice. Where we are committed to the same things that he's committed to. We're committed to doing what is right and to making sure that people always get justice. Passages like Luke chapter 4 spell out so much of what God's kingdom agenda is. When Jesus is announcing his ministry in Luke 4, he says, The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and a recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Do you see God's kingdom agenda in that? I am here to bring justice and help to the poor, to the blind, to the sick, to the oppressed, to those who are vulnerable, to those who are hurting. The kingdom is going to bring real help to them, and the kingdom is ushered in through ordinary people like you and me. To that end, Jesus declares his mission. The Son of Man came to seek and to save those who are lost. Do you recognize most of those that Jesus is seeking who are lost? The majority of, of those people don't look like us. They haven't embraced our values. They don't vote like us. They don't think like us. They don't worship like us. And yet Jesus loves them. And his kingdom agenda is to include them and to bring them in. In Revelation 5, when we were given a glimpse of, of the worship that's happening in heaven and the glory that's being, and credit that's being given to Jesus, in Revelation 5, 9, the, the words of adoration in heaven are to Jesus, with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. Friends, this is God's grand purpose in all of creation. That he would form a family of people for himself that would be made up of people from every group on the entire planet. That's a powerful picture, isn't it? It's not going to be white heaven. It's not going to be American heaven. It's not going to just be Western or European heaven. It's going to be the family of God that comes in all flavors, all colors. It's going to be so incredibly diverse. And in heaven, they are celebrating that fact right now. They are worshiping Jesus, who with his sacrifice, with his death, burial, and resurrection, he is pulling together this incredibly beautiful and diverse family. And we can't get in on what God is doing. We can't walk in the power and anointing of God unless we embrace his mission and his values. So let me ask this question. How does this relate to all that's going on in America today. There's so much noise. There's so much tension. There's so much energy being spent. It's really an interesting time. Not a lot of people are having fun in this moment, but it is, it is a moment for us to learn from, and it is a moment that we need to understand and hopefully be able to speak into. 
I want to just share a few thoughts with you about the moment that we're in and how the truths that we just looked at in Scripture relate to this moment. Now, first of all, I want to just share a general observation. Maybe I'm right, maybe I'm wrong, but I'll tell you the first thought that I have about what we're watching is I think that, that what we're seeing is certainly significant, and there's a lot that's positive about what we're witnessing across the country right now as countless people are speaking out and taking part in, in protests. And, and, and look, I, I get it. Not just for those of us in the room, but for lots of people who are watching and listening online. I, I get it. We, we've got all kinds of divided opinions about people who are marching, people who are protesting, and then all of the other spinoff stuff that's happening as a result of that. But can we agree together that while what they are protesting is a horrible thing, certainly the death of George Floyd by any account, anyone who has a heart and an ounce of compassion in them agrees that was, that was a horrible crime. Never should be excused, never should be allowed in America. There's nothing to debate there. We all understand that. The question, one of the questions is, what do we do in response and, and how, do we res how do we react to, to what's going on? How do we understand that? I, I would offer first the general observation that I think that what we're witnessing right now is not actually a movement. It's just a reaction right now. And I, I simply make this distinction to, to say this. In history, we've seen a number of, of great, important movements. And part of what defines a movement is that it has a lasting positive change on a culture, on a nation, or on the world. And we've seen a number of great movements. There are some things that they have in common. They begin in the heart and mind of God because he cares and he wants to elevate the human experience and he wants to usher us into the kingdom and into an experience of kingdom values. And so it starts with the heart of God and then God communicates something to a man or a woman or a handful of people who begin to be burdened for and passionate about this thing and then that begins to spill over on the lives of others and these people lead in a movement but they also shepherd those who are a part of the movement and it has lasting positive influence. Think about some of the great movements that we've seen in history. The Reformation is certainly a, a clear example of that and there were a handful of godly men that God used to lead in that and to shepherd it to define the direction and the boundaries of what was going on so people didn't just run off in every direction you see movements always have shepherds usually godly men or women who are who are keeping the movement on track I think about the first great awakening and and shepherds over that movement like Jonathan Edwards pastors that God had his hand on who helped to, to move things in a particular direction. And the American colonies were radically transformed as a result of that. The Second Great Awakening, to some extent, even the American Revolution, these are movements that started with God, that had key leaders that defined the boundaries of that. I would contend that the most recent major movement that we've witnessed is the Civil Rights Movement. It had profound impact. It was desperately needed. It started in the heart of God, and it had shepherds over it. Great men and women over it. People like Rosa Parks. People like Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. I, I think he was the ultimate shepherd over that movement in America. And thankfully, the things that we're witnessing happening in America today are still the carryover effects from the civil rights movement. The reason I say I don't think that what we're witnessing today is a new movement is, is for a couple of reasons. One, I don't see any shepherds over this movement. I don't see central figures who are, I'm just being honest, who are leading us toward, right now, toward a greater good that's going to benefit everyone doesn't mean it's a bad thing. In fact, I think most of what we're witnessing is a good thing. It, it, it is a positive reaction by and large because most of what we're seeing is people from all kinds of races and backgrounds stepping out into the streets to say, we will no longer stand for or tolerate injustice. Can we agree that's a good thing? When we will no longer sweep under the rug what is done to a black man on the streets of America, that that is no longer okay. Thankfully, we're not a lynching culture anymore, but we're also not a culture anymore that says, oh, the police, eh, whatever they do, we'll leave it to them. No. 
We are saying with one voice, that is not okay. We will not let that be okay. And thankfully, that isn't the norm anymore. We should be encouraged by that fact. But we see what's happening. It's not just people stepping up and protesting and saying, we cannot allow for injustice anymore. There's all this other spinoff noise and chaos that's coming out of it. This is not what the civil rights movement looked like. And, and so there are all these people with different competing agendas that are, are trying to rule the day in this. And so ultimately it doesn't have the feel of a movement. It has the feel of, of a reaction. And, and people are just kind of, it's like the book of Judges. Where the theme of Judges is o over and over, everybody did what was right in their own eyes. And so there would be chaos until a judge arose, a God-appointed leader who would call people back to order and back to movement in a particular direction, and the chaos would, would be quieted. Well, right now, we're seeing all of this spin-off chaos for lack of, of there being clear direction and shepherding. So that's part of what's going on right now. But here's another part of what's happening today that it's important for us to recognize we're being herded like cattle right now. White America and black America. We are being herded and prodded in specific directions. And ultimately, the source of that herding and prodding is hell itself. It is the heart and mind of Satan. Because he loves bias. He loves division. He loves stirring up distrust and hatred. And the truth of the matter is, America has made tremendous progress over the last century and over the course of most of our lifetimes. Great progress has been made, and nothing in the last two weeks or in the last five years has undone that progress. If we just pay attention, it is clear the fact that people are in the streets saying, no more, no more will we allow for injustice, that is a clear sign of progress. But here is the, the hurting and the prodding that's taking place. Now, I'm going I'm to say some things directly to white people, and I'm going to say some things directly to, to black people, and, and I know, we live in a time where we even just get offended by, by what we get called. Can we just love each other enough to let that stuff go? I know we're not really white, although I'm pretty close. White people aren't really white, and black people aren't really black, but we've got to call each other something. So for simplicity's sake, I'm going to say white people and black people, and let's not get offended by that. There are some things that, that white people need to understand and some things that black people need to understand. White people, we need to understand that we are being fed a message that is eaten up with lies. And I'm going to say it candidly. The heart of that message is about those black people. What a lazy bunch of thugs they are. That all the rioting that you see, all the looting, it's just those black people. That's just how black people are. They're lazy. They want something for nothing. They'd rather sit at home and wait on a check or go break in and steal somebody else's stuff. That is the lie to white people. And unfortunately, massive numbers of white people believe that lie. You don't have to put on a white robe and a white hood and go to a Klan meeting to believe the lie and to be a white racist. It is alive and well in America. We know that it is. Unfortunately, we've become civilized and socialized to the point that we've learned you don't get away with with saying certain things in public anymore, so we reserve our spoken racism for what's spoken in our homes. And we continue down that road because we believe the lies about black people, that they are somehow different, that they are somehow inferior, that they are lazy. These are lies from hell that the enemy wants you to believe, and we are constantly having that reinforced as we see on the images of our TV screens and our, our smartphones and computers the images of the looting that's taking place. Are there criminals out there who are doing things that are completely wrong, and are they trying to hijack what's happening in America? Absolutely. But do not let those images that represent a very small fraction of the population affect how you look at people whose skin color is different from your own. There are lies being fed to black people as well. And it's not hard to figure out what those are. To, to black people, the message is white people hate you, the police hate you, and all of these folks want to take advantage of you. They want to keep you down. They want to keep you poor. They always want the advantage over you. And to black brothers and sisters, I would say once again, that is a lie. The fact of the matter is 
huge advances have been made so that the things that used to happen in abundance very seldom happen anymore. I don't say that just as a subjective hope. It is a fact. Now, I don't know how much of the change is based on a, a true heart change in the way that people feel and, and the collective mindset of, of law enforcement and of white America. I hope that it's, it's grounded in that. Some of it, I'm sure, is grounded in the fact that there's far more accountab accountability than there used to be. There's body cams and dash cams and cell phones with, with cameras everywhere. So thankfully, people can't pull off the things that they used to pull off. With the result, I'm happy to be able to say this, that in the most recent year for which we have crime statistics available, which is 2018, there were only nine black people who were unarmed people who were killed in police custody in all of 2018. Now, that's nine too many, we would all agree. But in 365 days... In 50 states, there were nine victims who were killed, black people who were killed unarmed by the police. The reality of the matter is there were more than double that number of white people who were killed. And I know it may seem like, well, that's still disproportionate when you consider the numbers. Well, here's a part of the hard reality of the numbers. There are a lot more black people being arrested than white people. And I know this is where things start feeling uncomfortable for people like, oh, are we going to really talk about this? Yes, we are. For the people who are actually taken into custody in America, white people are 25% more likely to be killed in custody than black people. I don't know that that's something we ought to celebrate, but in some sense, that's progress. That there is no longer systematic killing of black people who are incarcerated. I know there's still such a thing as profiling. I know that there are still incidents where people are treated wrongly because of their race but the truth of the matter is the police have never in the history of America been as careful as they are today about how they treat American citizens whatever their color there are things that we have to address as white people and there are things that the black culture has to address on the white side of this equation Part of what we have to wrestle with, and I get it, nobody in this room, nobody watching and listening wants to hear this. If you're white, you don't want to hear this. But we are part of a culture that helps to create the problem that we have. And part of the problem that I'm referencing is, just, just a couple of examples, that black men in America represent 6% of the population, and yet they commit 44% of the murders in America. Black people across the board represent less than 13% of the population, but they commit 50% of the violent crimes. Now, white people are apt to hear those statistics and go, yeah, see, see, it is what I thought. That's why I feel the way that I do. You've believed a lie if those statistics just reinforce that feeling. That should be a warning signal to you that I do struggle with bias and racism because what we don't want to hear that we must accept is that white culture over time and still today helps to create an environment that fosters that when black children grow up in poverty with a limited nor number of open doors and when they grow up in environments where they don't have daddies so much of the time as a part of the equation and tragically still to this day in america 70 percent of black children grow up in homes where there is not a father present in the home once again, white people are apt to go, oh, see there, they created that problem. Friends, we created that problem. Our ancestors created that problem. And yes, it does go back to slavery times. And I know white people get bowed up when they hear that. we got to build a bridge and get over it. As white people, we love to say, I've never had a slave. I've never been a part of the whole slavery thing. No, we didn't own slaves. Our ancestors did. And in those days, we created situations where the black families were consistently being broken up and where fathers didn't get to be fathers in the home. And the black community has never recovered from that. It's not all our fault, but white culture has been a part of that equation. And to this day, there is a situation that we are participants in. We didn't create it, but we certainly benefit from it, where white people have gigantic advantages still over black people and Hispanic people and every other people group in America. And you know it's true. 
I mean, let me just say it this way. Suppose there's a really good paying white collar job, the kind of job everybody would want. If, if I or my wife apply for that job, and a black man and a black woman who have equal education, equal intelligence, equal experience and background, the four of us apply for that job, you know at least eight or nine times out of ten, one of us, Jackie or I, would get that job, even though our skill set and background was the same. That's the world we live in. And if we want to really take that all the way to its natural end, I get the job most of the time because I'm white and I'm a man. And we enjoy that benefit. And we want to turn the message off at that point and go, enough of that. I don't want to hear it. That is the world in which we live. And if we had all grown up in abject poverty without a dad present and without many opportunities before us, a lot more of us would have considered or actually turned to a life of crime. So part of the deal is we have to acknowledge that we live in a world that still puts us in a position of advantage and puts all kinds of other people, not just black people, but everybody who isn't white essentially is put at a distinct disadvantage. You and I can't just suddenly fix that, but we must accept that that is the world in which we live, and so we're going to have to be creative in reaching out and helping to elevate other people so that they have opportunities. So I say that part to white people, but I will say just as candidly to black brothers and sisters, this is not a problem that can be singularly fixed by white people. We want to see justice for everyone. We don't want to see another black man or a brown man or a white man die unjustly at the hands of the police. We don't want to see people experience hardship as a result of profiling. But understand, that will not just go away. There continue to need to be reforms among the police. But that is not going to change all that needs to be changed. Part of what has to happen is 6% of the population can't continue to commit 44% of the murders. 13% of the population can't continue to commit 50% of the violent crimes because as long as that happens, police are going to look at black people differently. Something has to be done to change that part of the deal, and part of it is what happens in the home has to be different. And so black brothers and sisters, there has to be a commitment from within the black community. We're going to do this differently. We're going to expect more. We're going to have to all do our parts here. And in this, we're going to have to accept and even celebrate some of, some of the good news and some of the, the hard stuff. I mean, right now, there's all this marching and protesting over injustice because a man has died at the hands of a police officer. I'll tell you what, I haven't heard anybody report on the news. And, and we should be offended by what happened here. But nobody on any news channel that I'm watching is saying that for every black man that is ever killed in police custody now, there are 18.5 police officers who were killed by black men in America. Friends, that part of the narrative has to change too. We can't make the police the bad guys and say it's us against them. There are problems in the white community. There are problems to be overcome within the police force. And there are problems in the black community. And it's just like in a marriage. Anytime I sit down to do marriage counseling, you want to know who everybody wants to talk about? Them. That's exactly right, Jim. I want to tell you what her problem is. Let me tell you what she's doing to make our situation bad. We're no different. When we talk as a country, when we talk between races, we want to say, here's what's wrong with those white people, here's what's wrong with those black people, and the truth of the matter is the only problem you can work on is your part. The only stuff I can address in my marriage is what I am messing up. So the police are going to have to deal with their part. White people, we're going to have to figure out how we can behave differently and how we can elevate the experience of those who are not white and make sure that doors are open to them and that we are showing them love and that we're not allowing closet racism to thrive in our homes and in our lives. And black people have got a part to do in elevating the black experience and not tolerating the things that have been happening on the streets. 
And I'll say another thing to go a step further. One of the things that has become a really, I don't know, a, a point of friction and tension in this is we know what the theme of the marches has been. More than anything else, it has been Black Lives Matter. We've, we've heard this for the past several years. And I'll just say aloud, a lot of white people hate that line. A lot of white people cringe and say, that's the, that's the wrong message. And I'll say this for my two cents worth. I think that it, it has been an appropriate and fitting message that white people, by and large, have misunderstood. I, I, think, the, I think the theme line is missing one word. It really needed two on the end. I think that's, that's ultimately what those who are marching have been asking for all along, is just that we would live in such a way that demonstrates, demonstrates that black lives matter too. It's not like, like black lives matter more than white lives or black lives matter more than anybody else, but that, that black people deserve the same justice that white people receive. And it was a cry of desperation that was a fitting cry, and we don't need to push back against that and act like that's wrong. But here's what I would say today. It's time for the message to change. Black lives do matter. Black lives absolutely have to, to matter as much as white lives. But we can't stop there. About 13% of America is black, but about 18% of America is Hispanic and Latino. And the last time I checked, black people and white people alike have not been good to the Hispanic and Latino people in America. You want to talk about people who aren't going to get the job, that's who's not going to get the job. About 5% of the country is Asian, and that's not even touching now on the, the fraction that's from the Middle East. Can you imagine how miserable the American experience is for people who come from the Middle East and who look like the Middle East? Boy, America's arms are not open wide toward those folks. And this, if it's going to, to be a movement, if what we're witnessing right now is to, to be an extension of the civil rights movement, it has to be a call for justice for all people. It has to be a call for elevating the experience of all people. You've heard the saying, a rising tide lifts all ships. So what we're crying out for right now, it has to be a cry for fairness and justice for all people groups. We're getting it already in the white community. We've gotten it all of our lives. And together now, white and black, we need to demand justice for black people and Hispanic people, and Latino people, and Asian people, and Middle Eastern people, all people. So where do we begin? How do we begin to engage in doing something beyond marching in the streets? Because marches run out of steam, and this one will soon run out of steam, the, the marching part. What do we do? Well, I think the first part is pretty straightforward. We don't do anything of any lasting value unless we first get honest about ourselves, our biases, our prejudices, and we truly repent. The worst thing I think that could happen in light of all that's going on in the country right now is that we would just become more jaded. And I hear, I, mean, I hear in so many people's voices, I'm just so sick of it. I'm so sick of hearing about it. Not as sick as some people are of being on the short end of the stick. We've got to move beyond just being sick of it and be willing to say, what am I willing to change? Am I willing to look in the mirror? Am I willing to go before God and say, Lord, I realize that in me there are there's some major biases. There are still some prejudices. I may not talk like it out in public, but I still carry it in my heart. And I realize that if I don't love people, then I can't really fully love you. I confess it for what it is. And I ask you, God, to begin to bring about change in me. Start helping me to love people that I don't naturally love. And then we've got to go a step beyond that. You don't learn to love people who are unlike you by just learning to, to just practicing that in theory. It doesn't work. It, it just doesn't. 
white people who don't like black people aren't going to learn to love black people just in theory. You've got to reach out and make personal connections. Black people who are prejudiced against white people and don't like white people aren't going to hear a sermon and suddenly love white people. You're going to have to build bridges with white people. And both white and black are going to have to actively build bridges toward people that are neither white nor black. And that takes effort and intentionality because we don't just naturally run in the same circles, especially if you live in a place like the Eastern Shore that is so particularly white that we are going to have to be intentional. I grew up a child of the Deep South. There are parts of that that I'm proud of and parts of that that I'm not. The part that I'm not proud of is I grew up being a well-socialized, quiet racist. No pride in saying that. My thoughts about black people as a kid growing up were not appropriate and they weren't true, but they were just a part of my experience. Part of the change that's happened to me over the years is just the work of God in a human heart, but most of the change that's happened in me didn't happen in a vacuum. It didn't just happen in my prayer closet. It happened as a result of entering into relationships with black people who have had a profound impact on my life, black people who I have come to love and enjoy and respect so much. Some of my closest friends are black people. Some of the richest people in terms of what they pour into my life are my black friends. And I'm not suggesting by any means that I have arrived. I just know I wouldn't be where I am without having those people in my life. It doesn't happen by accident. Do you have people in your home who don't look like you? Do you go to dinner? Do you meet people for lunch or for coffee who don't look like you? If not, we have to be intentional in reaching out. One of the people who I love that models what I'm talking about in just profound ways is Eileen Creek. Eileen keeps me kind of apprised a of, of what she's involved in doing. Many of you know Eileen. She always sits about where Dave's sitting right now in the middle section. and She's a retired RN, and Eileen sent me this, uh, this email recently. And I want to read it in closing as just a picture of someone who reaches beyond her own natural experience and beyond her own race and find such joy in doing that. I'll just pick up in the email. Eileen says, um, Hi, Mark. I'm very sad that the pandemic is making it impossible for, impossible for me to travel this year for my usual two months of mission work in Guatemala. But God is so amazing, and he continues to use me right from home to minister to Spanish-speaking people both here and in Guatemala. Today, my Guatemalan son's biological cousin in Guatemala posted on Facebook that she was ready to give up. I messaged her, and it turns out her family of five has no food. Thanks to the generosity of Freedom Church members who have donated money for my work, I was able to wire her grocery money with advice from Mary Purvis about how much would be adequate, etc. I took two phone calls today from Guatemalan friends in Foley who needed me to interpret over the phone while they were in the ER with their little son who fell off the couch and had a nasty forearm laceration. The ER doctor was very patient with our over-the-phone interpreting, and the child was cared for. The Honduran lady in Fairhope, who was homeless, is now in a trailer after I was able to connect her with assistance from Ecumenical Ministries and food from Freedom Church. She's still looking for a job, no English, no transportation. I still take nearly daily phone calls from the lonely 18-year-old Guatemalan boy in Mobile Metro Jail. Mary Purvis put me in touch with a man in Guatemala that I knew from our mission trip clinics who is now in prison. He was in desperate need of medication and food, so I was able to use some of the donated money for him. He now visits with me almost every day on Facebook Messenger. He will need ongoing funds to purchase medications for a serious chronic illness that the prison does not treat at all. I'm sorry for this message getting so long. I just love to share with you the things our Lord is letting me do using my Spanish fluency and my familiar with and love for Hispanic people. Believe me, I could go on and on. I really appreciate your prayers and support and the donations from church members that have allowed me to make financial con contributions when necessary. I'll see you online Sunday, Eileen. That's beautiful. As an ordinary person, without any kind of extraordinary resources, just saying, God, use me 
to love people who don't look like me. And right here in very white Baldwin County, she has more opportunities to meet more needs and have greater impact than we could ever imagine. And she doesn't have to take out an ad in the paper. I say that to say, not only is that a beautiful example to encourage us, but there are opportunities for all of us. But we've got to take the initiative. America is moving in the right direction. Don't be brainwashed. Don't believe the lies. God is moving us in the right direction. But we need to be intentional about participating in this. God's kingdom values trump everything else. Would you join me as we turn to him together in prayer? Father, we give you thanks for how you love us. Thank you for how you have called us to be yours and you've put us in this position of, of leadership and influence in the world. I pray that you would teach us to love one another. I pray that you would teach us to love people who are not like us, who don't think like us and don't look like us. Oh God, I pray that you would break our hearts over our own hardness and our own bias. Holy Spirit, we pray for deep conviction and real heart change. We don't like having to go here, but we, we ask you, oh God, root out prejudice that has, for many of us, that has been there for decades. I pray that by the work of your Holy Spirit that you would begin to call to mind faces and names of people that you want us to now to reach out to, to make contact with, to express love toward, to check on them, to, to eat with them. I pray, God, that you would help us to build bridges of love and compassion and to find ways to show the love of Christ to people who may not look like us. God, we thank you for the beauty of diversity. We thank you that heaven is filled with people from every language, nation, and tribe. We pray that you would make freedom to look like heaven. Thank you for what you're doing in Freedom Church in Nigeria. Oh, God, bless and multiply that work there and here. Teach us to love like you love. We give you thanks for the chance to represent you, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.